Hey everyone, I hope you're doing well. Uh, as you know, one of the key accusations that keeps being leveled against Israel, against the Jewish people, is that there's some sort of genocide going on against those in Gaza. I want to take I want to take a look at this clip with you. It's really well done. I think that the military expert that they're speaking to on trigonometry, Nick Freitas, has as goes through in a in a very uh, very methodical way the uh, dismantling that accusation. Take a look with me, if you will, and, um, and and watch what he's talking about. You've served, you've probably seen some urban combat, I'm guessing. People like us who've never been in that situation, I hear, you know, I have my own views on it and having sort of read and listened and whatever, but ultimately I've never been there. Mm. People talk about what's happening in Gaza and they say, you know, it's genocide, it's this, it's that. And then other people say, well, look at the civilian to combatant death ratio. Actually, this is the like most humane operation in history. Like, what do you make of all of that? I think the people that are calling it genocide um, are either being intentionally dishonest or don't know what the word genocide means. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's very intentional on their behalf. Um, when it comes to civilian casualties, there's a lot of people that like to do what I call Excel spreadsheet fighting. And what they do is they look at the Excel spreadsheet with Israeli military capability and Hamas military capability and say, why do they need to do all of this? Like, look at how much more powerful they are. The reason why asymmetric warfare exists is when you have a weaker force that is attempting to utilize the strengths of the stronger force against them. So they're putting themselves in the best uh, advantage possible. So we, I did a video on this. We have a program called The Why Minutes. And we talked about what is Hamas's strategy. And one of the questions that, that I asked when I looked at this from a strategic standpoint is, okay, so Hamas knew when they went into Israel that they weren't going to overthrow Israel. Um, when they took hostages, they knew that the IDF was coming for them. Um, and yet they did both, right? So they, they knew they couldn't defeat the IDF militarily. And they knew getting hostages would force the IDF to come after them in a big way. Um, so why'd they do that? And, and how did they know that Western academia and media would almost instantly be on their side? And, and the reason why is because a, a lot of these organizations have invested very, very heavily within America academia. Um, I, I don't know the numbers for, for European academia, but I'm, I'm assuming it's probably significant. Um, at, at the same token, they understood that the way that you manipulate Western media and Western sensibility is civilian casualties. Because even though we can look at our own histories, whether it's the firebombing of Dresden or dropping you know, atomic weapons on, on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, we've, we've certainly been able to get over our, our problem with civilian casualties, but we also pride ourselves in attempting to avoid them to the extent possible and reasonable. Urban warfare makes it incredibly difficult to do that. Because the, the fight now is not my smart weapon against your AK-47. The, the weapon is now my guys, and, and the strategic advantage is they have aerial over armor, right? And night vision, maybe, right? But you can they can buy night vision for you know five grand on the black market. So it's not like Hamas can't have access to that. And so now if you're in a position where you benefit strategically from civilian casualties. You have the perfect environment to maximize that in a way that no other military can other than giving up. Because if I have to, I, like I've, I've been in that environment where you are kicking in multiple doors to try to get to your bad guy and every other room, there's women and children. And we go through an incredible level of training in order to make sure that you hit the right target. But that's a, that's a complex environment, especially when that one time kids moving on and old picks up an AK-47 and starts shooting. Is, is that a civilian casualty or is that a military age male? Well, in, in that moment, that's a military age male. You're shooting at me. That's not how it's going to be reported by Hamas and who will dutifully report X number of children on the objective. So what is considered reasonable mitigation of civilian casualties? Well, well it, it isn't warning everybody ahead of time that I'm going to go into your neighborhood. It, it certainly isn't calling them on their cell phones ahead of time and saying, hey, we're, we're about to attack this area. It isn't doing drones where you, you bring stuff down going, please leave the area. We're about to attack this house. 
And yet the IDF is doing those things. I, I'm sorry, there is no, <laughs> there is no measurement that we can utilize with respect to how militaries engage in combat operations with a legitimate and honest attempt to mitigate civilian casualties and not come to the conclusion that it, at the very least the Israeli ground forces have tried to do, have gone above and beyond whatever those standards might be. And so at this point, what an honest media would be asking is, why do you insist on keeping women and children in combat zones? You're not, Hamas is not confused about where Israel is gonna go. Why won't they move them out of the areas? Why do they keep them in those areas? Why do they insist that they stay? And, and another video we did a while back was we asked the question on why don't more Arab countries accept Palestinian refugees? The answer is they used to. And then Palestinian refugees sided with Saddam Hussein when he invaded Kuwait. They tried to overthrow the Jordanian government. They did help destabilize Lebanon. They've caused problems within Egypt. And so it, it's not that I don't, it, it's not that I am trying to minimize civilian casualties when they take place. But I think it's absurd to, to rationally look at what is going on on the ground right there and then come to the conclusion that Israel is just saying, if Israel wanted to do genocide Gaza, they could. And it wouldn't have taken them this long. They didn't. Now, here's the, now let's ask the reverse question. If Hamas would have had the strength on October 7th to do everything it wanted to do, would Israel still be here? We know what they do. I, I visited the music festival. I visited some of the kibbutz. I'm not confused about what they would do with similar power. And so th that's the part where I get, I get frustrated by this because again, I understand Americans that are saying it's Israel's war, not ours. I get that. I get it when they say it's Ukraine's war, not ours. And I do believe that, again, we should think strategically about what our involvement is going to look like. But I also think that we shouldn't engage in this kind of moral relativism where it's just, well, it's just not our problem. Okay, not primarily. But Hamas actively seeking, targeting, and killing women and children because they believe it's perfectly morally justified, taking hostages. I I'm looking at some of the people on the right, too that are talking about this, especially some of the tough guys on the right. And I'm like, if it was your kid in Israel right now, you would not be calling ahead to see, hey, just wanted to let you know we're gonna be coming in. You'd be kicking doors and beating the living piss out of people. So spare me your moral outrage when Israel wants to do the same thing. I once did the numbers. I was like, okay, if Mexico crossed into Texas, killed 40,000 people, and kidnapped another 1,500 to 2,000. And then the EU called for the United States to engage in discretion and a ceasefire. I can tell you how quick we tell them to go F themselves before we went down there and proceeded to demonstrate to everybody in the world that that was a really bad idea. So I, I don't want, look, <laughs> I don't want Palestinians to die. I don't want Israelis to die. Um, but if one side gets to continually engage in terrorist operations and start wars with, with the rest of the world just immediately calling for a ceasefire the moment you hit back, that's absurd. And what you've actually done, what the West has taught Hamas is that the more civilian casualties you get, the more funding you get, and the more support you'll get. We've incentivized them killing their own civilians by not demanding that they not do that. This is 100% correct. And for Israel, every civilian that's killed, even on the other side, is a tragedy. However, for Hamas, every civilian that is killed is a strategy, a strategy to boost up the numbers, a strategy to uh, utilize the media outlets around the world at looking at Israel in a, in a negative way and, per, and, and growing that perception. And um, it needs to stop. Every single death, every single human life is valuable in this world. Every civilian casualty is a tragedy, but the responsibility, who, lie, who bears the responsibility for every civilian casualty in Gaza that lies squarely on Hamas that could end it today?